The following program, The Russ Belleville Show, is intended for responsible adults only. We advocate to the repeal of marijuana prohibition for adults. We discuss the science, culture, and controversy about America's marijuana laws. We do not advocate any illegal activity and encourage all listeners to learn their state and federal marijuana laws. Opinions and claims made by guests and advertisers on the Russ Belleville Show are their own, and the Russ Belleville Show cannot be held legally responsible for their validity or reliability. Viewer discretion is advised. You take a seed, you plant it, you grow it, you dry it, you roll it, you smoke it. You take a seed, you plant it, you grow it, you dry it, you roll it, you smoke it. And it goes down smooth. Hey! Spanning the continent to bring you the truth about cannabis and marijuana law reform. I smoke pot and I like it a lot. <laughs> From the promise of legalization. Prohibition. One major responsibility is to encourage people to use less drugs. The Rush Belleville Show, the voice of the marijuana nation. Brought to you by the National Cannabis Coalition. Yeah, I hear you. You had a question for me. I... Now, here's your host, Radical Russ Belleville. All right, good day, tokers and tokettes, and welcome. It is Monday, August 6, 2012, and it's got to be 420 somewhere in the world. Also, from a historical perspective, isn't it the uh, anniversary of the bombing of Hiroshima today? August 6 seems to uh, come to mind. I think that is true. But uh, we're going to talk about things other than our history lessons here on National Cannabis Radio. Thanks for joining us. We're kind of running with a, a different crew today because uh, Cannabis Carrie is out today. She is uh, getting some some stuff taken care of up there in Astoria. And Ganja John is still out in Seattle getting some work done there. So holding down the fort here over in the engineer's desk, we've got uh, Wiz Coleco hanging out there. How you doing, Coleco? Aloha. Doing quite well. Let's not mention the bad things about America's history. Oh, wait. We're talking about marijuana prohibition. That's right. right. It kind of fits in with all those, bra those bad things. Also, we've got uh, Brian the Red hanging out over here on the co-host slot. How you doing, Brian? Hey, hi, everybody. Good to see you here. We've got a jam-packed show for you today, all sorts of news to get to. Of course, we're all following uh, the Olympics uh, lately, and uh, we are breaking the news of another U.S. Olympian out for a positive marijuana test. We told you the story of Stephanie Lee, our wrestler, who was out for a positive test. We've got another Olympian who is out uh, as of today, just broke this morning. We will tell you all about it right after our first break when we get to the Daily Cannabis Chronicle and your latest headlines. Also included in those headlines, we've got got tales of the DEA's uh, recent seizures of marijuana being way, way down. Tax court decisions that could affect dispensaries nationwide. Speaking of dispensaries, the Arizona Dispensary Lottery will be taking place online. And we've also got a new commercial promoting marijuana legalization, this time in Washington from the folks at New Approach Washington, uh, working on getting I-502 passed. We'll get all of that to you in our Daily Cannabis Chronicle. Then at 20 after, we get into your Daily Toker Tunes, and today is Roots Monday, where we look at the best of jazz, blues, country, and folk uh, in the uh, realms of marijuana music. And today I'm going to take a look at the reefer jazz side of things. Uh, you know, I did a, uh, a, a Viper Hour show last Tuesday. We're going to do another Viper Hour show tomorrow at 8 p.m. And I looked at the history of Satchmo, that is uh, Louis Armstrong, the great trumpet player. Well, one of his collaborators back in the day was Mez Mezro, who has a big role in the reefer jazz era. We'll tell you all about him, his clarity network and play a couple songs for you uh, from the reefer jazz era so stay tuned for that then at half past we are debuting a brand new segment that's going to appear on first and third mondays here on the russ belleville show the segment we're calling listen to your mother and it's going to feature guests from moms for marijuana and other female oriented marijuana reform organizations with their tales of why they think legalizing marijuana would be the best thing for their families and for their kids then at the end of the show we'll have a little bit of a time for a radical rant 
that, I'm going to take a look at that U.S. Olympic team and the uh, members that have been thrown off for their marijuana use and compare and contrast that with the drinking culture that surrounds the Olympics and sports in general. That's all coming up on today's Russ Belville Show. And then in hour two, we'll take your calls in Toker Talk Radio at 971-533-7111. You can always get a hold of us via Twitter. I'm at Radical Russ on Twitter. The show is at RB Show 420. And National Cannabis Radio is NCR 420. Find all of those on Facebook as well. Or you can always send me an email, Russ at RadicalRuss.com. Be right back with the news after this. The voice of the Marijuana Nation. Support the Russ Belleville Show. Text the word Russ to 420-420 and connect with the National Cannabis Coalition. You can also send 10 bucks to the Russ Belleville Show right from your smartphone. That's Russ to 420-420. You're listening to Radical Russ on the Russ Belleville Show. Wiz Coleco's wallet and cell phone are missing. Again. And Taco Bell's already been searched. We got to look somewhere else. Marijuana's not going to re-legalize itself. You've got to do your part. Join the National Cannabis Coalition today at nationalcannabiscoalition.com. Medical marijuana, industrial hemp, ganja sacrament, consumer cannabis. The topic of marijuana is heating up the news, and the Russ Belleville Show catches you up with today's latest headlines. Now, here's our senior news editor, Cannabis Carey, with the Daily Cannabis Chronicle. Kerry has the day off today. I'm Russ Belville with your Daily Cannabis Chronicle. Number one U.S. Judo Olympian Nicholas Del Popolo is out for a positive marijuana test. He's Team USA's number one Judo Olympian at the 73-kilogram level. Nick De Popolo has become the first competitor knocked out of the Olympics for a positive doping test, not just for marijuana, but for any of these substances that are on the banned list. The U.S. The US judoka, who finished seventh in Olympic competition, says he inadvertently ate some food that had been baked with marijuana in it before leaving for the Games. Del Popolo is the first Olympic athlete caught by the IOC for use of a banned substance post-competition. Stephanie Lee, Team USA's number one wrestler at 72 kilograms, was one of the athletes caught before competition. She was banned from the Olympics for testing positive for THC prior to leaving for London, which she claims legal use of for a medical condition. The IOC has stripped his Olympic accreditation, that is, uh, that is DePopolo's Olympic accreditation, and will ask the International Judo Federation to change the final standings for the 73-kilogram judo competition. The IOC asked the governing body of judo to, quote, consider any further action within its own competence, end quote. The IOC has invested $30 million in a laboratory with 150 scientists working around the clock to test 6,250 samples collected from London athletes, a 50% increase in samples from Beijing four years ago. Pharmaceutical giant GlaxoSmithKline is, parent, is partnering with the Olympics to provide the facilities and the labor for the drug testing. World Anti-Doping Agency Director General David Howman told CNN, quote, if they are cheating, they are likely to be caught, end quote. However, former anti-doping chief Dick Pound tells CNN, quote, maybe 10 percent of athletes use drugs and we're catching one or two of them. People who have prepared in advance and use drugs coming here to London won't get caught, end quote. 
Cannabis is on the World Anti-Doping Agency's list of banned substances. Most substances on the list are there because of their ability to enhance performance or to mask drugs that do. The World Anti-Doping Agency makes no claim that cannabis is enhancing any athlete's performance. It is simply the illegality of cannabis that lands it on the anti-doping list. If it were a matter of protecting the athlete's health, Budweiser wouldn't be a corporate Olympic sponsor. It, too, would be on the banned substances list. The World Anti-Doping Agency keeps athlete samples frozen for further testing for eight years in case some new technology is developed to detect previously undetectable doping. Let's hope that the famous bong picture of Michael Phelps is the only evidence of his pot smoking from 2004, 2008, and 2012. If the most decorated Olympian ever were forced to surrender some of his 22 Athens, Beijing, or London Olympic medals, then perhaps public outcry would force the World Anti-Doping Agency to rethink its ban on cannabis. New Approach Washington launches television ad campaign encouraging the conversation about marijuana regulation. New Approach Washington, the committee supporting Initiative 502, will launch a three-week media campaign on Wednesday to open a conversation about marijuana regulation. The campaign will feature a 30-second ad that will air on broadcast and cable television throughout western Washington and also online. Allison Holcomb, campaign director for New Approach Washington, said, quote, An overwhelming majority of Washington citizens agree that treating marijuana use as a crime has failed. However, they haven't been provided the opportunity to consider what a new approach might look like and how it might be better for our communities than the current prohibition model. We want to start that conversation, end quote. The ad will premiere Wednesday morning during KING and KOMO's early morning news from 5 to 6 a.m. Pacific time and on Comcast NBC Sports Morning from 5 a.m. to 9 a.m. Pacific time. The ad may be previewed at newapproachwashington.org, and we will preview that ad for you on our video screen right now. I don't like it personally, but it's time for a conversation about legalizing marijuana. It's a multi-million dollar industry in Washington state and we get no benefit. What if we regulate it? Have background checks for retailers, stiff penalties for selling to minors. We could tax it to fund schools and health care, free up police to go after violent crime instead. And we would control the money, not the gangs. Let's talk about a new approach, legalizing and regulating marijuana. The Arizona Medical Marijuana Dispensary Lottery is to be streamed online. This will be live online thanks to Compassion First. It's Medical Marijuana Dispensary Lottery Eve in Arizona. Tomorrow, the state of Arizona will decide who gets to open medical marijuana dispensaries, and it's going to be streamed live online. Arizona Department of Health Services Director Will Humble has on his own blog, which explains the lottery process. Quote, Next Tuesday, August 7th, is Selection Tuesday for our medical marijuana dispensary applicants. By the end of the day, we'll have whittled the initial pool of 486 medical marijuana dispensary applications down to 99. We won't be allocating the full allotment of 126 registration certificates on Tuesday because 27 of our community health analysis areas had no applicant at all, leaving 99 community health analysis areas with at least one applicant. About 75 of the 99 had two or more applicants, so we'll have about 75 drawings on Tuesday. We'll post an updated summary on how many eligible applications there are by district on our website before the drawing. We'll be using a device that blows pre-labeled ping pong type balls inside of a clear cage to randomly select the successful applicant in each competitive area. We'll go CHAA by CHAA, starting at number one and continuing through number 126. The agenda for the day is posted on the website azdhs.gov slash medical marijuana. The first selection will begin at 9 a.m. and will finish around 1 p.m. Applicants will be emailed the number of their balls in advance, and all applicants will be notified of the selection results electronically by Wednesday. The successful applicants will receive their registration certificate after they complete their required dispensary agent paperwork. The process will be webcast live on the internet at livestream.com slash A-Z-D-H-S. That's livestream.com slash 
A-Z-D-H-S tomorrow, and the entire event will be recorded and posted on the Arizona Department of Human Services dispensary website. Because of the large number of applicants and the limited capacity of our facility, credentialed media, a few agency staff, and our independent auditors will be the only folks that will be invited to the selection location. The act doesn't allow us to identify the applicants by name or even business name, so we'll use application numbers to identify the successful applicants. We'll also post a table of the successful applicants by application number on our dispensary website by the close of business on Tuesday. Well, <laughs> it's interesting that we're going to uh, figure out who is going to be uh, tasked with the important job of ensuring the safety of medicine that is produced and distributed to the sickest, frailest, most disabled Arizona residents the same way NBA teams figure out who gets the first pick in the draft. <laughs> lottery, really, it's all gonna be about a lottery here. And of course it has to be a lottery because they set a, a, a maximum number of dispensaries that can exist. And if I'm not mistaken in, in the Arizona Act, it's uh, one for every 10 dispensaries. And, and somebody can correct me if I'm wrong on that, but I think that's what the, the limit is here. And so we set up this artificial limit in no way uh, ma uh, you know, uh, representing what the market would really allow in this scenario based on however many patients there are or how many people are willing to provide. No, we're just going to pick an arbitrary number and then have a lottery to pick who, who are going to be the people who get to run these businesses. Really a lottery. I, I sure hope there's a, there's a few more standards as far as the application process goes. So at least we're randomly picking from people that are qualified to do this job, who have the patients first in mind and, and are willing to abide by safety and security standards because just picking, you know, random balls, random ping pong balls like we picked the lottery, uh, doesn't sound like the best way of distributing health care to me. A U.S. tax court decision could haunt medical marijuana distributors nationwide. Uh, the ruling disqualifies all dispensaries from most tax deductions. There was a big federal tax court decision last week that will no doubt affect every dispensary in America. The decision in Olive v. Commissioner, a case out of California, disqualifies all medical marijuana distributors from most tax deductions. The ruling by the United States Tax Court, which oversees disputes over federal income tax, was unanimous. A unanimous decision leaves little hope that it will be overturned on appeal. The tax court judge, Diane L. Krupa, wrote, quote, the dispensing of medical marijuana, while legal in California, among other states, is illegal under federal law. Congress has set an illegality under federal law as one trigger to preclude a taxpayer from deducting expenses incurred in a medical marijuana dispensary business. This is true even if the business is legal under state law, end quote. According to Accounting Today, quote, while his business was legitimate under California law, Section 280E of the tax code precludes a deduction of any amount for a trade or business where the trade or business or the activities which comprise such trade or business consists of trafficking in controlled substances, which is prohibited by federal law, end quote. Robert Wood wrote an excellent article for Forbes in which he described that some, but not all, dispensary deductions are still valid. The IRS and tax code must abide, abide by Section 280E of the tax code. However, the U.S. tax court has allowed dis dispensaries to deduct other expenses distinct from dispensing marijuana. If a dispensary sells marijuana and also engages in the separate business of caregiving, the caregiving expenses are deductible. If only 10% of the premises is used to dispense marijuana, most of the rent is deductible. Still, good record keeping is essential. Well, uh, once again here, we have this 280E, which was an IRX, IRS tax code that was written against the cocaine kingpins of the 1980s. The idea was, is if we caught Tony Montana and he had gold-plated AK-47s and his own, his own ranch full of, of exotic a animals and a Learjet, that we could then, you know, he couldn't deduct those kind of things. We could take those kind of things away from him. You know, he couldn't deduct that from his business operations. These were never meant to go against people that were operating businesses according to state law, trying to help people, trying to help sick people that need medical marijuana. But it doesn't matter to the prosecutors. They've got this tool in their toolkit, and they're going to use it against legitimate medical marijuana providers. We can fight this. Representative Barbara Lee is trying to protect the landlords of medical marijuana dispensaries from those threatening letters. We've got other bills from Barney Frank and uh, Representative Ron Paul to protect uh, the lawfully operating uh, medical marijuana uh, 
uh, operations, a new House bill that has been uh, entered to protect them from the Justice Department crackdown. So uh, some people in Congress are trying to do something about this. They need your help. You need to get on the phone and call your local representatives, call your congressional representatives uh, at the White House line. It's 202-456-1414. You can get through to Congress, 202-456-1414. You can call them. Uh, also, we have the Truth and Trials Act. The Truth and Trials Act sponsored by Representative Sam Farr. Uh, Barney Frank and Ron Paul are also co-sponsors, where people that are tried in federal court can at least admit the truth. They can specify that they were lawful medical marijuana providers, lawful medical marijuana users, and be able to have that in court, where currently in federal court, they can't even use the word medical and marijuana in the same paragraph, lest they be cited for contempt of court. So there's so much that needs to change, and most especially the federal prohibition on marijuana needs to change so that these tax deductions can't be used against lawful businesses, whether that means rescheduling down to two, three, four, or five in the scheduled, or just dropping off the controlled substance list altogether. We've got to make this change. These legitimate businesses should not be punished, and their patients should not suffer. It's 420 back in Idaho where Russ and Carrie were born. So we have to go uh, connect with our roots. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah. Please support these sponsors who support the Russ Belleville Show. Hey, big thanks to uh, the guys out at theweedblog.com for today's news stories. Check out theweedblog.com for all your latest news updates. When we come back, we got some Mez Mezro and some Reefer Jazz for you. Stick around. It's the Russ Belleville Show. You know you talking to that Reefer man. The law offices of Omar Figueroa would like to remind you to stand up for your rights. Please do not give up your precious liberties. There's nothing wrong with standing up for our constitutional rights, and in fact, it's the only way to honor the Constitution that recognizes our natural rights. Treat law enforcement with respect and respect the Constitution by standing up for your rights. If you are detained or arrested, stand up for your rights by repeating, I respectfully invoke all my legal and constitutional rights. I do not consent to any search and seizure. I want to remain silent and I want to speak to my attorney, Omar Figueroa. Omar Figueroa has more than a decade of experience in federal and California courts and graduated from Yale University, Stanford Law School, and Trial Lawyers College. Please contact the law offices of Omar Figueroa at 415-489-0420 or 707-829-0215 or on the web at www.omarfigueroa.com. 17 states and the District of Columbia have legalized the use of marijuana for medicinal purposes. Over 70% of the American public supports the use of marijuana for medicinal purposes. What does Governor Mitt Romney think of medical marijuana? So medical marijuana is legal in Colorado. One of our viewers, Bill Ferguson, asked, should marijuana be legalized for medical use? Aren't there, issues, aren't there issues of significance that you'd like to talk about? The medicinal use of marijuana is a significant issue to the millions suffering from cancer, AIDS, and other chronic pain, nausea, spasticity, and seizure disorders. I, I think marijuana uh, should not be legal in this country. I believe it's a gateway drug to other uh, drug violations. The use of illegal drugs in this country is leading to terrible consequences in places like Mexico and actually in our own country. Okay. I, I, I oppose legalization of marijuana. Everyone knows music and marijuana go together, so let's wind up our 20 after break with the Russ Belleville Show's Daily Toker Tunes, the best in pod safe 420 music from around the web. Today is Roots Monday, featuring the blues, country, folk, and jazz music that birthed the modern sounds we enjoy today. You can get downloads and more information about all our daily toker tunes by visiting music.radicalrust.com. Now, sit back and enjoy your daily toker tunes. All right, so today we are going to be talking about uh, Mez Mezro. And if we get, a, get into reefer jazz, you can't uh, get into reefer jazz without talking about him. He's a very big figure uh, in that early movement, working with guys like Louis Armstrong. And he was a decent clarinet player and saxophone player, but he's 
primarily known for being, well, basically the white man who introduced white audiences to this, this black art form that was coming out during the, uh, the 1920s. Uh, he just embraced African-American culture and everything that was going on there. And uh, you may re re uh, recognize the name Mez uh, from one of the other songs we play here, If You're a Viper. If you've heard the lyric, uh, dreamed about a reefer five feet long, a mighty Mez but not too strong, that was referring to Mez, Mez Mezro, who was a, a well-known marijuana user along with many of the jazz players of the day. Uh, he was born in 1899 and he died in 1972. And then we're going to play for you a, a couple of songs that he recorded back in 1936, a part one and a part two song, which were often done back in the day, uh, a song called Eyes a Muggin. And of course, you got to remember that the uh, slang term muggles back in the day referred to marijuana as well. So Eyes a Muggin sounds to me like someone who's trying to get high. This is Mez Mezro and his swing band on your Roots Monday with Eyes a Muggin, part one and part two. <laughs> I hear about you mugging. I'm getting ready to tell you about it now. Eyes a mugging. I, I, I mean eyes mugging. I, I, I said eyes mugging. Bubby bum 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 bum. Eyes mugging. I, I, I mean I'm mugging. Of course I'm mugging. Bum 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 bum. We're going to do some mugging with numbers. Well, explain it to me, Matt. All right. Beginning at one, start counting upwards. When you reach seven, say, uh. When you reach ten, say, woof. When you reach any number containing a seven, or any number into which seven can be divided, say, uh, uh. When you reach twenty, thirty, or any number up to seventy that ends with a zero, say, woof, woof. All right, boys. Here we go. One, one two, two, three, four, four five, five, six. Uh, eight, nine, wolf, eleven, twelve, thirteen, uh, uh, fifteen, sixteen, uh, uh, eighteen, nineteen, wolf, wolf, uh, uh, twenty-two, twenty-three, twenty-four, twenty-five, twenty-six, uh, 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 twenty-nine, wolf, wolf, thirty-one, thirty-two, thirty-three, thirty-four, uh, uh, thirty-six, uh, uh, thirty-eight, 
Hi, this is Dan Michaels. If you're looking for professional voice talent for your commercial or podcast, I'm your man. Visit danmichaelsaudio.com for more information. Here are some of the things you may hear on the Libra Lounge. And now the news. Bitches got something to say. If, if Obama wants to be voted, he has to end prohibition. You heard it here on the Libra Lounge. To visit here Wednesday nights at 6 Pacific. Or visit thelibralounge.com for archives and links to download current episodes. Be a lounger. Be a the Activism begins with ACT. The Rush Belleville Show features the stories of hardworking grassroots activists working for an end to prohibition in today's activist agenda. Welcome back, everybody. 31 past the hour, and we are starting a brand new segment, which I don't have an intro for yet, but we will have an intro for it. It's Listen to Your Mother, and uh, we're doing this in association with MomsForMarijuana.org, as well as other female-oriented marijuana legalization groups. So if you've got a mom out there who should be heard from, whose story needs to be told, let us know here at the Russ Belvale Show. You can email me, Russ at RadicalRuss.com. Joining us today for our inaugural segment, I'm really happy to have her here, Sharon Ravert. She's from Georgia. She has a very personal story that got her involved in marijuana reform activism. Sharon, how you doing today? Hey, I'm doing well. Thanks for having me, Russ. Now, you are currently uh, the Georgia director for Moms for Marijuana. Is that correct? That is correct. All right. So uh, we've got a great picture of you up on our uh, our video screen right now, our webcam screen. Uh, you and it appears to be your daughter at her graduation. Uh, and I know the story, but just to give everyone an idea of what it took to get you to stand up for marijuana legalization, tell folks about the, the raid that got you you know, hopping mad. Okay. Yeah. I would say I was hopping mad. Um, my daughter had some friends over real briefly. Um, one of the kids had some, uh, marijuana in his backpack and about, he left here after being here about an hour and went back to town. He got busted. And within six hours, they were at my bedroom door, knocking on my door with a search warrant, looking for my daughter. Yikes. Um, that's pretty much the basics of it. And from there, they uh, went downstairs and grabbed her out of bed with a gun to her head and took her off to jail, made her miss a few classes at school. And uh, 
and we went from there. I was I was a little bit upset about it, to say the least, and I uh, just went from there and started reading as much as I could about prohibition and about cannabis and and about the laws that we have in our country and realized that things were going wrong mm-hmm. now, and that it, I wanted to get involved in trying changing that, to ha, try and change that. Had this been your first encounter with law enforcement? Yes, I, um, I have lived in Atlanta my whole life, uh, been out where people were smoking pot throughout my whole life and had never seen anything like this go down so it opened my eyes and i started researching like i said and saw that it was going on all over the world until there was a police officer a swat guy knocking at your door with an automatic weapon uh had you any idea your daughter was was using marijuana uh i i had an idea yeah that she was using marijuana we um we had talked about it i have an open you know i'm i'm an open mom and i pretty much taught my kids about marijuana when they found out that their older cousins were were smoking with their friends and stuff and and i started talking to them openly about it because i figured if i told them a lie about marijuana and i had had used it before and knew the truth about it uh that it was not addictive and all those things and so i figured if i lied to them about this they may not believe me when it comes to meth and heroin and it just scared me to death so i told them the truth now good for you uh now as far as your daughter and uh, you know, getting roused out of bed over this uh small amount of marijuana what were some of the uh, consequences after that well she was uh after searching for three hours in the house they found 1.5 grams of <sighs> marijuana oh my they found um a couple of pieces of paraphernalia and an old grow light, <clears throat> excuse me, I work with dogs, so we sometimes have grow lights to keep dogs warm and stuff like that when they give birth. And they found an old grow light. So and she, had, she on, hadn't been cultivating in any way? Oh, no, no. Uh, uh, no, she hadn't. Uh, but with, with the grow light, of course, and the marijuana, the grow light obviously grew marijuana um, in their eyes. So she was facing 26 years in jail. Wow. 26 years. All right. So uh, she's busted. She's facing 26 years. Uh, How does it go down as far as the the trial and anything like that? Well, uh, originally, um, the juvenile judge offered her to do drug court, which is a two-year program here. And you pretty much go in and they run your life for two years and give you all kinds of stuff. You pay lots of fines. And I just looked at him at that moment and said, you're not putting my kid in a drug court and sit her next to a bunch of heavy addiction people, heavy drug users. Now, I mean, if it had just been for pot smokers, I mean, good, go on. But they were going to put her in with all these these addicts. And it scared me that she would bond with them because she was, you know, she was only 19. Yeah, I was still concerned about that. So we said no to that. And we took it all the way to a jury trial. And when we went in um, for the day of the trial, they offered a plea deal that we didn't feel like we could, you know, say no to. Right. But it took it took you pushing the issue, uh, not getting shuttled off to a drug court, you know, pushing it to a jury trial to make them want to make that deal. Right. Absolutely. Yes. Hmm. No offer of that until the day we walked in and we're about to pick the jury. Wow. So, uh, again, we're speaking with Sharon from Georgia. She's with Moms for Marijuana. It, it is org, I think. Moms for Marijuana dot org. Yes, okay. monsterfromarijuana.org, yes. Yeah, and you can check out the web address. It's up there on our uh, our screen. We'll also put it out in our chat room as well. And uh, so this, uh, you know, obviously got you galvanized and galvanized to action here uh, for uh, ending uh, marijuana prohibition. Did this uh, end up affecting any of her uh, post-high school uh, education? Did it end up affecting loans or anything like that? It did not, and I'll tell you the reason why is because we we decided we had to weigh out the situation. We could pay for a lawyer, and um, and work through this, or we and and have her be able to keep her student and financial aid to go to college because she was already in college when this happened, or she could have lost her student aid, and it, it ended up being that it would have been cheaper just to hire a lawyer. So that's the way we went. Along with the fact that now she doesn't have a record. She she got very lucky and honestly it was because we 
took every penny we had out of our savings account and she worked very hard and diligently through that two years getting prepared to go to court to have you know the money and pay us back so yeah. so it puts you guys out a lot of money all your savings it, it risks your daughter's uh, possible uh, education the rest of her possible career and all over somebody you know spilling their guts and a search that yielded 1.5 grams of marijuana is that a good uh, summation that's a very good summation. Oh, wow. So <laughs> tell, tell us why then, you know, as a mom, that you think legalization here is the way to go. I mean, it sounds pretty obvious. You want to keep your own daughter out of out of trouble and having any, any sort of uh, problems. But a lot of parents out there might say, well, you know, marijuana, it's a gateway drug. Bad things will happen. It's against the law, et cetera. What do you tell, especially, you know, in, in North Georgia like that, where the, the culture is very anti-marijuana, how are you getting through to other moms up there that this is the right thing to do? Well, originally, when I first started talking about it, it was pretty simple because they looked at myself and I'm a business owner and, and I'm a member of all kinds of different organizations up here. And they looked at myself and my daughter and thought, these people are not criminals. So that was a stepping stone, honestly, that helped me get involved because they, they knew we were not criminals, yet this happened to us. Mm -hmm. So they were questioning what was going on. Um, as far as that's concerned, I just pretty much tell people that, that prohibition is more harmful to our families than marijuana ever could be, ever has been, or ever will be. And I can back it up with all types of, of um, research. You know, nobody's ever died from marijuana. We, you know, and I, and I also point, I remember when um, I was watching actually you and, and Kevin Sabat at Rice University, and when he said, you know, let's get past this we know it's not a gateway drug well all i have to do is pull up that video and and they believe him for some reason so you know <laughs> i do things like that i just point back to stuff that that the prohibitionists are saying and show how silly it is yeah well that's good and and now you've been involved in this for a while uh, I remember coming out, in fact, today I was wearing the uh, Capital Cannabis Jam t-shirt earlier today. Uh, so I met you back in November. Uh, that means you've been doing this for, what, eight months now, eight or nine months? Uh, tell us how things have progressed in your activism career. Well, things are progressing pretty good. I'm, I do a lot of different stuff, but it's all for the cause. Um, I'm working with Moms for Marijuana. I also do Peachtree Normal. Um, and I'm working with them and we're in the process of um, getting our final packet together to uh, send out to the legislators. We're working on that right now. And I don't know if you realize it, but in Georgia, we only get from January through March of every year to talk, to go down and introduce legislation and do all that kind of stuff. And also we don't have, you know, voter initiative type stuff. So we've got to actually find legislators that will will um, submit bills and vote on them. So it may take us a while, but we're working on it. And, and everything that y'all do out West, it helps us because I can point back to y'all and say, look, they did it and the sky has not fallen. Exactly. And speaking of, speaking of out West, uh, you're making your way out here for Seattle Hemp Fest for the first time. Uh, you excited about that? Uh, I'm so excited. I'm about to start packing, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Two weeks away, we're still going to start packing already. Well, well, Sharon, we appreciate you coming on the show and, and all the great work you're doing. And want to let folks know that uh, Sharon's also been very gracious with her time here on National Cannabis Radio. Uh, she was a guest on the Libra Lounge, which is one of our shows uh, out of uh, Iowa. And if you'd like to hear that show with a, a much more extended discussion of issues and, and what's going on in Sharon's life, uh, check out our chat room right now, uh, Lively Libra is out there and she's posting the uh, address to the show back from uh, June I believe it was June 23rd and uh, you know you're just fast becoming a rising star in this movement thanks Sharon for you know speaking out and, and providing you know such a, a great face for moms out there that are that are trying to uh, to work for the end of this prohibition well thank you so much for us for having me and everything you're doing I look forward to seeing you in a couple weeks all right it's gonna be a good time uh, thanks so much listen to your mother and our first listen to your mother segment with Sharon from Georgia. Look forward to more of these, and uh, we'll talk to you in a couple weeks. Sounds good. Thank right. you. When we come back, it's time for a Radical Rant. We're going to talk about uh, drinking in the Olympics should be a sport of its own. I'll be right back after this.
The Russ Belleville Show is blogging and podcasting daily at RadicalRuss.com. I don't like it personally, but it's time for a conversation about legalizing marijuana. It's a multi-million dollar industry in Washington State and we get no benefit. What if we regulate it? Have background checks for retailers, stiff penalties for selling to minors. We could tax it to fund schools and health care. Free up police to go after violent crime instead. And we would control the money, not the gangs. Let's talk about a new approach, legalizing and regulating marijuana. Almost busted in Laredo, but for reasons that I'd rather not disclose. I smoke pot, and I like it a lot. Hi, this is Willie Nelson. I learned a long time ago that marijuana is a lot safer to use than alcohol. There's absolutely nothing wrong with the responsible use of marijuana by adults. It's time we stopped arresting and started respecting responsible marijuana smokers in America. And to learn what you can do to help, please contact Normal at www.norml.org or call toll-free at 888-67-NORMAL. The show was long and we were just sitting there. And we'd come to play and not just for the ride. Come to Seattle, the greenest city on earth, on September 14th, 15th, and 16th to celebrate the greenery of the Pacific Northwest. That's right, High Times Magazine is hosting the High Times Medical Cannabis Cup in the Emerald City. Top businesses of the cannabis industry will be in attendance, showcasing cultivation gear, paraphernalia, stoner apparel, and more. Check out the finest cannabis products of the medical cannabis industry. Meet High Times Cultivation Editors Danny Danko and Nico Escondido. They'll teach you how to grow top-grade ganja. And Elise McDonough will be there too. She's the author of the official High Times Cannabis Cookbook. Be there for the High Times Medical Cannabis Cup Awards when High Times honors the top sativas, indicas, hybrids, edibles, and concentrates submitted by Washington's top dispensaries. And don't forget the High Times Bash for VIPs on Friday night. One major party with top musical guests. Go to MedCanCup.com for details. Come to Seattle for the High Times Medical Cannabis Cup on September 14th, 15th, and 16th at Fremont Studios. You want answers? I'm as bad as hell, and I'm not going to take this anymore! You want answers? You have offended my family. I think I'm entitled. You want answers? I want the truth! And you have offended Shaolin Temple. You can't handle the truth! Surely you can't be serious. I am serious. And don't call me Shirley. Hoorah! Radical Brandt. All right, we're going to continue my investigation on the stories of Stephanie Lee and Nick Del Popolo, who are the two American martial artists disqualified from the Olympics because of their use of marijuana. Now, whenever a story comes up like this, I often like to look at other angles that might give us some insight onto why marijuana is treated this way. So today I decided to take a look at alcohol use and the Olympics. Now, of course, Heineken UK is an official London Olympics provider and supplier. I suppose that means they're providing and supplying Heinekens for the uh, athletes. Budweiser is an official sponsor of Team USA. Yet, according to the American College of Sports Medicine, quote, alcohol consumption is high enough for alcohol to have been named the most abused drug in Olympic sports by the U.S. Olympic Committee, end quote. According to, according to their report, quote, alcohol abuse is at least as prevalent in the athletic community as it is in the general population, end quote, and has negative effects on reaction time, hand-eye coordination, grip strength, jump height, fatigue, aerobic performance, and hydration. Unlike marijuana, alcohol, quote, affects the body's every system, linking it to several pathologies, including liver cirrhosis ulcers, heart disease, diabetes, myopathy, bone disorders, and mental disorders, end quote. So we have alcohol, this drug that is harmful to every system in the body, according to the American College for Sports Medicine. And yet, 
in a recent ESPN story, various athletes talk about the wild sexual romps that the top one one hundredth of a percent of the human gene pool engages in in the Olympic Village. But hidden within that story are many indications of the booze abuse that fills and fuels those sexual romps. Quoting from the ESPN story, says Swiss swimmer Dominic Mike quote, I'd get home from the clubs at 6 or 7 a.m., and I'd feel bad for the track and field guys. They're getting on a bus, and we're intoxicated, wearing fedoras, looking like crap, end quote. For U.S. swimmer Ryan Lochte, that typically means, quote, hitting a local pub and drinking with the soccer hooligans, end quote, he says. Quote, Athletes are extremists, U.S. soccer goalie Hope Solo says. When they're training, it's laser focus. When they go out for a drink, it's 20 drinks. Quote, if you were walking by, you would have thought it was a high school party, says NHLer Bobby Ryan of the silver-winning 2010 Vancouver Hockey American squad. I'm talking booze, people randomly making out, everybody else cheering them on, and that was the PG stuff. Then everything went inside, end quote. Says Australian soccer's Alicia Ferguson about the closing ceremonies, quote, They basically throw us all in a stadium and say, just go for it, party hard, get drunk, and do some groping, which we did with some Canadians, end quote. The best part, according to Solo, quote, When we were done partying, we got out of our nice dresses, got back into our stadium coats, and at 7 a.m. with no sleep, went on the Today Show drunk. Needless to say, we looked like hell, end quote. Quote, Everybody partnered up fairly rapidly, and when they'd bring a drink cart through the airplane, we'd send it back dry, end quote, says U.S. shooter Josh Lakatos about flying home from the Olympics. It's all from the ESPN story. Various Olympians not just talking about their alcohol use, but bragging about the alcohol use, bragging about the Olympic culture that encourages binge drinking. Now, in other news, Australian rower Josh Booth was just kicked off the Olympic team and sent back home after he got so drunk he required hospitalization and he vandalized two store windows after finishing sixth in his race. He got all mad and punched out some windows. After apologizing and paying for the damages, he was not charged by police. He was sent home along with two Australian swimmers named Nick Darcy and Kenrick Monk. Now, they got kicked off, well, not kicked off the team, but they got sent home because they got in trouble with Australian swimming officials when they posted some pictures of themselves holding automatic pistols and pump-action shotguns at what looks to be a legal U.S. gun store. Officials called the social media postings of the guns, quote, foolish and clearly inappropriate for members of the 2012 Australian Olympic team, end quote, and banned them from using Twitter or Facebook which was not the case for the Tour de France winner and British cycling gold medalist Bradley Wiggins. We've got a tweet of him, one of his tweets, along with a photo that's entitled Getting Wasted at St. Paul's. And in another tweet, he explains how he is, quote, blind drunk at the minute and overwhelmed with all the messages, end quote. Now, the British Olympic Association didn't admonish Wiggins for any foolish and clearly inappropriate social media use in that case. In fact, they praised him for his advocacy of alcohol overdose. Quote, he is absolutely thoroughly entitled to have a fantastic party and celebrate, British Olympic Association Chairman Colin Moynihan said Thursday. Quote, nobody deserves it more, end quote. Now, this comes despite indications that Wiggins, the cyclist, may have a little bit of a drinking problem. This is uh, from a story that uh, was posted on, uh, where did I find this, E! News uh, here. It's extraordinary what he has done, said Andy Hunt, head of Britain's Olympic delegation. There isn't a person in the country who wouldn't want to buy him a drink, end quote. After appearing at his second Olympics in 2004, Wiggins was downing drinks for months after the Athens cauldron was extinguished. Now he says the drinking is under control. And now let's get back to the Americans, because long before his famous bong photo, U.S. swimmer Michael Phelps had to deal with charges of driving drunk in Maryland at the age of 19 when drinking is not legal after the 2004 Athens Games. He dodged any sort of jail time for that incident where he ran a stop sign while driving under the influence. Fast forward to 2009, uh, he, was out spot he was spotted partying in New York and, quote, 
drinking straight from a bottle of Grey Goose, end quote, and had, quote, ordered four bottles of vodka, end quote, according to the New York Daily News. And this week, his teammate, U.S. swimmer Ryan Lochte, was found to be partying hearty in London, as noted by E! News. On Sunday, the 28-year-old Olympic swimmer ventured into London's nightlife scene. Accompanied by his teammates and a few unidentified lady friends, the fashion-forward athlete celebrated until nearly 3.30 a.m. An eyewitness told E! News that Lochte was, quote, surrounded by girls, end quote, in the VIP area of China White's nightclub, tearing up the dance floor and drinking champagne and $800 tequila. Quote, he was having the time of his life, end quote, said the witness. Now... All of this alcohol use, of course, is legal and accepted. And as we mentioned, Heineken is a London sponsor. Budweiser is a Team USA sponsor. But you've really got to wonder why alcohol is not on the list of banned substances and cannabis is. The World Anti-Doping Agency maintains this list of these prohibited substances for athletes. And making that list usually depends on meeting two of the following three criteria. Number one. It has the potential to enhance or it enhances sport performance. Number two, it represents an actual or potential health risk to the athlete. And number three, it violates the spirit of sport. Well, alcohol certainly matches number two, representing a actual or potential health risk to the athlete. There's no doubt about that. As for number one, enhancing sport performance, well, the American College of Sports Medicine says, quote, low amounts of alcohol at the range of 0.02 to 0.05 BAC can result in decreased hand tremors, improved balance and throwing accuracy and a clearer release in archery, end quote. But only archery and karate and motor sports ban alcohol use in competition. As for number three, the violating the spirit of the sport, well, if the spirit of sport is to celebrate the fittest and finest in human achievement, how does promoting the abuse of one of the most harmful drugs to humans not violate that spirit? So, to summarize, if you use medical marijuana and quit weeks before your wrestling match, or if you accidentally eat a marijuana brownie before your judo match, and you get caught, you violated the spirit of sport and you must surrender your Olympic dream. But if you use alcohol that is far more harmful, not only can you promote it through your social media, as long as there's no guns in the picture, but technically you could compete drunk without any sanction. Yeah, that's right. You could technically chug a beer and then go run the 100 meter dash, but you'd be disqualified if they detected a joint in your system from two weeks ago. Absolutely true. And for those of you folks out there who have this attitude, and I've, I've read it in a lot of the comments pages on the blogs about this issue that say, well, I have no sympathy for them. They knew what the rules were when they broke them. You're missing the point. Of course, they knew what the rules were and they ended up bro breaking the rules. In the case of uh, Nick's case, maybe accidentally because he didn't know there was, you know, pot in the brownies or whatever. But still, that's not the point. The point is that the rule is stupid and we are disqualifying the best and the brightest in sport for reasons that have nothing to do with cheating and everything to do with morality. This is just the World Anti-Doping Agency uh, trying to maintain uh, the, the prohibition on cannabis through the demonization of its use when no demonization is necessary. You know that they very rarely ever have to punish these athletes for getting caught doping on cocaine or heroin, sometimes amphetamines, uh, some prescribed amphetamines to increase performance, but very rarely street meth, right? Street drugs of any kind. Why would it only be cannabis that these athletes are getting caught with? Because they know it's safer than alcohol. We have, our, we have standards now in U.S. Olympic sport that is that, that not only prevent athletes from using a safer substance in marijuana, but a culture that actually encourages unsafe use of alcohol, the binge drinking, the partying that's going on at the Olympic Village. 
and and the people that have this attitude, like the British Olympic uh, Association, where they're saying, "Well, he deserved it. They deserved a party. They deserve to to tie one on. They they deserve to relieve some of their stress. They work so hard. They 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 deserve some time to just let go." I completely agree. The question is, if we have recognized that these people lead stressful lives and they deserve release from that stress, why do we force them to do so in the most harmful way possible? Let's end this ban, this anti-doping ban on marijuana, not to say that we approve of marijuana use or that athletes should use it, but just because it's a stupid reason to get rid of some of the best athletes on the planet. Thanks for joining us here for Hour 1. We're going to stick around for Toker Talk Radio in Hour 2. You can call us at 971-533-7111. We'll have more news stories and discussion with Wiz Coleco and Brian the Red. So for everyone here at National Cannabis Radio, thanks for joining us. And until next time, take care of each other, Tokers. This is the Russ Belleville Show. The Russ Belleville Show is blogging and podcasting daily at RadicalRuss.com. You take a